A professor claims that it takes the average student no more than 40 minutes to finish his final exam. A random selection of 39 students was, was timed while taking the final. The students had an average completion time of 41.6 minutes and a standard deviation of 6 minutes. Use a 1% significance level to test the professor's claim. Give the practical interpretation of the outcome of the test. Okay, so here it says use a 1% significance level to test the professor's claim. So that's pretty clear that we're doing a hypothesis test, right? When it says test the claim, we're doing a hypothesis test. So once you know it's a hypothesis test, the next thing you have to do is to identify the claim symbolically. So it says test the professor's claim. It says a professor claims that it takes the average student no more than 40 minutes. So in symbols, we're going to write this down as the mean related to 40 minutes. When we say no more than, what does that mean? That means a maximum, right? It shouldn't take any more than that. So it should take less than or equal to 40 minutes. So that's how the claim is written in symbols, right? So watch out for these phrases like no more than. Um, sometimes people have trouble interpreting those. Just try to think of it in another way, you know, like, um, you know, uh, the typical American family has no more than 10 kids in it or something, you know, try to think of something that will make sense to you phrase it another way, try to find a statement in English that makes sense to you so that you understand what they mean when they say no more than. In this case, of course, it's less than or equal to. Um, if you have trouble with those things, the best thing you can do is just practice different scenarios, try to word things different ways, and try to make sense of them. Um, there's really no easy way to teach that, unfortunately. Okay, so let's go on to the second step, then, is to get HO and HA. So our competing pair of hypotheses are created in this step. And what you want to do is look at the claim and identify the symbol that's there and then figure out whether it's HO or HA. If the claim has an equal to sign in it at all, so if it's less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or equal to, it's HO. So in this case, the claim is HO, and we'll fill that in in that position. HA, therefore, must be the opposite of this then. So if we say the mean is less than or equal to 40, the HA must say that it's then greater than 40, because this covers all the cases, right? Okay. So our competing pair of hypotheses are set up. Next step is to create, or record, sorry, the data. In a real problem in the real world, you would actually have to come up with the data by doing sampling. Um, here, however, we just take it from the problem, so record it from the problem. All right, so let's try to figure out the things we need for a hypothesis test about the mean. We will have an n, we will always have an x bar, we will have a standard deviation of some sort, and we will have a significance level of some sort. So let's try to get the n for this particular problem. It says a random selection of 39 students, right? 39 students then becomes our n, so n is 39. The, they were timed while taking the final. The students had an average. That means the x bar, right? Completion time was 41.6 minutes. And a standard deviation of 6 minutes. This means that s is 6 minutes, or 6. And then finally, it says use a 1% significance level. Remember, alpha is the significance level, so that's 0 0.01. Okay, you've recorded the data. Now we have to put the data into our test stat formula. So when you're doing a hypothesis test about the mean and the sample size is large, we're going to go ahead and use the Z test stat formula, right? So the Z test stat formula is going to be x bar minus mu sub 0 sigma divided by the square root of n. Remember, that's our test statistic, right? Test stat. Okay, now enter the things you have. X bar is going to, of course, be 41.6 minus this number, which comes from HO based on that little subscript of zero that's telling us to get the number from the hypothesis with that same subscript of zero. And we end up with 40 there. Sigma can be replaced by S as a substitution. And then the square root of N is the square root of 39. Okay, so let's work this out in our calculator. Of course, this difference on top is 1.6, and then you'll divide that by 6 divided by the square root of 39. All right, let's just do the whole thing, though, all at once. I'll put the top part in parentheses, 41.6 minus 40. Close it up. Divide by parentheses 6 divided by the square root of 39. Okay, entered it all in, and my calculator gives me 1.67. 1.67. 1.67. Okay, so there's my test statistic. Once I have the test statistic, I have to put that onto 
a curve and compare it with my critical value, right? My critical value will let me know if this is extreme enough to reject HO. Before you even do that step, you might want to pay attention to the size of the z-score and see if it looks, some, looks like something that could cause a rejection. So this is not that extreme. It might not reject HO here, right? We're looking for an extreme z-score, something like 2 or 3. Those are usually good ones that will reject. If it's something less than 2, it depends on the significance level, of course. But usually if it's less than 2 um, or significantly less than 2, then it won't reject HO. All right, so let's do our step five, which is to get the critical value. Draw the bell curve. From here, you want to look at HA. Remember, it's HA that determines what kind of test we're dealing with. We look at the symbol in HA, and we say, is that indicating a left tail test, a right tail test, or a two tail test? Remember, if it's greater than, it's like a arrow pointing to the right, and that'll remind us that it's a right tail test when it's greater than. Okay, so if the test stat lands over here, we're going to reject HO. If it lands in here, we are not going to reject HO. So we're looking for that Z-score that would go there, right? It should be positive since it's on the right-hand side, so when we get the number from the table, we'll just put it there. So again, how do we get the number for here? Well, as long as our alpha value is something we can find on the t-table, we'll use the t-table and use the last row of it to get the large um, infinity uh, values, which are basically the z-score values, right? So let's go down and look up alpha under infinity on the t-table. Remember, we look up alpha whenever it's a one-tailed test. If it's a two-tailed test, we look up alpha divided by two. So in this case, one tail, we just look up alpha. Okay, so let's go to that table and try to get our critical value. So we're looking at 0 0.01 down at infinity. Okay, so here there's the 0 0.01 column, and we're gonna go straight down till we reach the very bottom. And we find the answer to be 2.3, Two six, two point three two six. Okay, so the table gave us the value two point three two six. So our critical value was two point three two six. All right, now that we have the critical value, it's time to form the initial conclusion. Our step six. The initial conclusion involves us comparing our test stat to our critical value. If the test stat on this number line here ends up in the white space here, we will not reject HO. But if it ends up all the way into the tail, we're going to reject HO. So when I look at this test stat of 1.67, I realize that on the curve, it would be somewhere over here, right? It's before 2.326. And if it's in this part of the curve, we're not going to reject HO. So our conclusion is do not reject HO. Do not reject HO. If we're not rejecting HO, we do not support HA. All right, remember these go hand in hand. If you're not rejecting HO, you're not supporting HA. Not rejecting HO is like saying, hey, this evidence doesn't conflict with HO, so HO is okay. If HO is okay, then HA cannot be okay, so you should not support it, because remember these are in competition. If one's good, the other must be bad. All right. Now, at that point, we have to decide our final wording, right? The final wording, the final conclusion is based on these statements. Either we're going to say we do not reject the claim or we do not support the claim. The question is, which one was our claim? Was it HO or HA? So we go back to the claim and we look at it and we say, okay, that guy had an equal sign, so we called it HO. That means the claim and HO are the same. So we should use the wording that's attached to the HO here. So we'll say the sample data does not allow us to reject the claim. The sample data does not allow us to reject. Reject the claim. Dot, dot, dot. And you can just fill in the claim. The claim that the mean is less than 40, less than or equal to 40. 
All right, so let's try to come up with the practical interpretation then. We're saying the sample data does not allow us to reject the professor's claim, right? The professor claim it doesn't take more than 40 minutes to finish his exam, right? That it takes no more than that. It's either 40 minutes or less to finish his exam. This sample data does not contradict that, basically. We're not able to reject his claim. You can see why. Even though our sample mean was a little higher than 40, it's just barely higher, and that could just be simply due to random sampling error, right? It's not significantly higher is the point. So even though it's a little higher than 40 minutes, it's not significantly higher, so we don't have enough evidence here to refute the professor. Maybe another study would show something different, but at this moment, based on uh, this set of sample data, we're unable to contradict the professor's claim.